Welcome once again to the Radical Imagination, the show that imagines and tries to bring about a more caring, loving, and just world. I'm your host, Jim Vredoves. I'm a sociologist at John Jay College here in New York City. I'm so glad that you've all joined us for a show that I've been wanting to do for a long, long time. Imagining an academic world without dark money. Much of the inspiration for the show comes from the widely acclaimed recent book, Dark Money, by New Yorker writer Jane Mayer. She referred to the term as the basis for the hidden history of the Koch brothers and a small number of allied billionaire plutocrats who invested in the campaigns of others and essentially bought their way to political power, hijacking American democracy and giving rise to the radical right. The brothers, among other things, fund think tank position papers, media pundits, and politicians to promote the privatization of Social Security, resegregating of public schools, opposing busing and supporting neighborhood schools with the aim of destroying the public school system. They support pollution by killing environmental regulation, advocate busting of trade unions, lead efforts to disenfranchise African-American, Latino, elderly, young, and disabled voters. They support home for foreclosures, the Keystone Pipeline, and are major climate change deniers. That's for starters. Koch Foundation grants with over 115 colleges and universities are drawn up to allow the brothers to have excessive control over recruitment, syllabus design, publishing and research with the aim of exposing students exclusively to their ideology and point of view. The money was meant to be kept in a dark, secret place, hidden from public view, transparency, and disclosure. My guest on the show has been in the forefront and cutting edge in exposing and spreading the word on these scandals and outrages. When I contacted Jane Mayer about her book over the course of several emails, she over and over again mentioned his name as the authority and go-to person that she has used in her own research. So I'm thrilled to have Connor Gibson from Greenpeace Investigations on the show. He's truly one of the unsung heroes who is courageously imagining and forging a much better world. Welcome, Connor, to the Radical Imagination. Thank you, Jim, and thank you so much for the kind words. Well, they're, they're heartfelt and they're absolutely necessary. Uh, so, Connor, tell me a little about how you got into this research. You know, funny enough, I never saw myself as a researcher for Greenpeace working on higher education. What I really was working on was the financiers of climate science denial. Um, your viewers may be familiar with corporations like ExxonMobil and Peabody Coal, financing scientists and pundits here on TV in the attempt to uh, confuse us over the science of climate change. And the Koch brothers have vastly exceeded um, both uh, ExxonMobil and many other financiers of climate change denial. What happened is that eventually led all the way into the classroom. I was contacted by some students at George Mason University in Virginia, uh, shown a syllabus and saw some very alarming things. There was a Koch-funded think tank uh, putting up one of the textbooks for the course. It was called Global Warming and Other Eco-Myths. Hmm. That gives the idea of the kind of bend of the book, and, uh, and that was from the co-funded Competitive Enterprise Institute, a think tank in Washington, D.C., well known for uh, opposing solutions to climate change and battling the scientists who were studying it. Um, so at that point, I said, this is a problem that extends far, far beyond the halls of Congress. This is, this is leaking all the way into the classroom, it seems like, and if a company can finance professors um, to favor certain viewpoints, and that goes as far as denying science outside of your expertise, then we have a, a very big problem. I realized I was not the only person with these concerns at all. There have been students at Florida State University who had been working on holding the Cokes accountable since 2011. Um, 
an alumna named Kaylin Jordan was working hard at Suffolk University to expose a co-funded think tank uh, that was cranking out studies for the political network. And students in Kansas also came to us with their own concerns. At that point, I said, a trend is a trend. We should probably uh, work together and see uh, what we can do in terms of letting the world know what Charles Koch is trying to do with his campus philanthropy. So you're a student yourself, is that correct, when all this information and these people started contacting you and then you joined Green, Greenpeace Investigations, or how did that happen? Well, I was with Greenpeace first, and I, I had that ah. as a student. I, okay. was, I was totally unaware of this issue. I actually don't think I knew who the Koch brothers were when I was a student myself. I learned just after I graduated. Um, and then I got a fellowship with Greenpeace. It was about a year after that that we saw the controversies start to heat up at Florida State University. Right. Uh, and that was a case where some professors and graduate students uh, blew the whistle. They, they revealed that the Koch brothers were given some control over for hiring at Florida State. They, they would give a grant and then a panel of people that included representatives of the Charles Koch Foundation would be able to scratch names off the potential list of hires. So that's how the higher education uh, scandal in regard to Charles Koch began in full. I was watching that from afar. Um, it wasn't until a year later that the students from George Mason University came with me to, uh, about concerns about climate science denial in their mm. classes. Uh, and at that point, that's when we really started getting more proactive and trying to figure out who else was interested in working on this. So I'm just curious, and I'm sure our audience is as well, uh, is there some family background of activism uh, that you identify with, or just this was a, a natural righteous indignation? How did this uh, fire in the belly uh, grow in you here? <laughs> I think it's all relative. I would, I would imagine that the average uh, citizen would would see me as a as a as a rather colorful kooky person in terms of the protests I've engaged in and the career that I've that I've chosen for myself. But I don't have a particularly radical background with my family. Hmm. Um, it's my I was raised rather progressive. I had very fair parents um, who tried as best they could in the very white state of Vermont to educate me and uh, you know things like privilege and race relations and uh, stuff like that, that that I didn't have much exposure to, but. I don't know how much of that had to do with eventually becoming an activist. I think it was once I was exposed to the fact that an industry would pay scientists and fake experts in mm. order to advance their business interests, you know, to advance their business um, on the, a lie, on a premise that isn't true. That's really what spoke to me and to realize that there were people that were working to hold those forces accountable, companies like ExxonMobil and Coke Industries. Uh, um, the private prison industry in the United States, the pharmaceutical industry, I, the tobacco industry uh, was the first to get it started. That really spoke to me that a, a person can play a role in, in fact checking a dishonest entity that might not be doing what they're trying to say, what they say they're doing. Right, right. Uh, this is nothing new, is it, on, on campus? Or is this the Koch brothers and their influence and their involvement? Is this something? qualitatively different than what has gone on for decades and decades. I mean, the university world, especially the privileged elites in, in, the, uh, in the Ivy League schools, have always been basically um, a force for the rich and powerful, the, the, the children of these, of, of these adults, of these parents, uh, have always gone into the businesses in the political world uh, to run and dominate the country. So is this something new, dramatically new? Is, what, what is different? with the Koch brothers and their attempt to uh, rig the system in a sense? That's a great question. That was the question that we had when this all started. We saw from the news in 2011 in Florida State that the fact that a, a private funder could have some say in the hiring of professors clearly was, was not okay in terms of the precedent it set. Uh, but we really leaned on the expertise of others to make sure that Greenpeace knew what it was talking about in terms of higher education. And we looked to the teachers unions and we looked especially to the American Association of University Professors. Their guidelines on academic freedom and their faculty governance on campus. What we found is that it's the issues of faculty governance and academic freedom that are most at threat uh, by what Charles Koch is doing. And as far as I've seen, his model is unprecedented. Of course, corporations have always used the campus as a place to recruit your uh, employees, as a place to uh, 
encourage students to train in the skills that, that their industry finds valuable. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Charles Koch is doing is actually uh, a twofold uh, strategy. One is to influence the culture of the country, and the other is to recruit his army of uh, lobbyists that will do with that culture change. Uh, they have something they call an integrated talent pipeline, where students that are in coke funded economics courses or philosophy courses or whatever the class might be, they have opportunities to join these free market reading groups where Charles Koch's book is assigned and the book is canonical or assigned, and also some of his ideological opponents, I say, like Karl Marx. And these students are then given opportunities to go into co funded nonprofits. The Charles hmm. Koch Foundation runs paid internships with housing stipends, and you get placed at a co funded think tank in Washington, D.C. That's pretty good. I didn't hmm. have any sort of job opportunity of that kind when I was coming out of school. If somebody was offering me a, a paid internship and a housing stipend, that would be something I would have to stop and think about. And I think a lot of students are measuring their morals versus the economic opportunities in, in, in a limited economy. And Charles Koch is one of the people who knows that that is a pressure point that he can exploit. I would say the second thing that makes Charles Koch unique is that he is interested in a long-term culture change. And part of what he's funding is he's trying to fund a movement of people who agree that capitalism is moral. Uh, Charles and some of his uh, some of his political friends have realized that the country doesn't necessarily uh, agree that capitalism is a moral economic uh, ideology or system, and they are trying to change that. They would love for students to, to think that uh, capitalism is more merits than perhaps the public has decided. So, absolutely. So, so give us a little more of a historical background. This goes back to the culture wars of the 60s, in a sense, right? With John Birch Society and the rise of the, uh, the, the Goldwater movement and so on. So, uh, the Koch brothers go back to that era, uh, are you saying, and, and, and were advocates of uh, right-wing conservative politics at that point and have sort of revamped their struggles to meet the, as you put it, the economic crisis uh, of the contemporary world, or how is that working? That's correct, and this is where Jane Mayer's book, Dark Money, comes in, I would say. She did an excellent accounting of a lot of the history that was not out there, both of the Koch family and the, the growth of Koch Industries, which is the engine, obviously, that's fueling all of Charles Koch's political and philanthropic activity, uh, but also some of the other uh, founding fathers, if you will, of corporate, mm. modern corporate influence peddling. Uh, people like John M. Olim, who was a chemical magnate, and Richard Mellon Scape, who inherited a banking and, and uh, oil fortune, uh, who actually died recently. These are some of the names that people don't recognize, mm. uh, but should recognize as very similar to the Koch family. In fact, ahead of the Koch family in terms of innovating many of the ways that they have changed politics and changed culture, um, and just kind of try to change the way people think about free enterprise. I think free enterprise is a key word. One document Jane Mayer talks about in her book that's very important for our work as well is a memorandum that was written by Lewis Powell in 1971. Now, Lewis Powell eventually was appointed to the Supreme Court by Richard Nixon, Nixon. Mm -hmm. but just before that, he wrote this memo to a friend of his at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and it was the plan of attack, basically, for corporations to become much more powerful in uh, politics. And he said, not only does the U.S. Chamber need to become the lobbying voice for all big business, so just to represent the interests of big business that are always united, as opposed to squabbling over different industry preferences. He said, you need to fund the politicians much more heavily. Uh, Powell said that we need to fund, that business people need to fund the media and leverage their advertising buying power to influence what is reported and not reported, um, as well as buying media companies. And we've seen how much media has consolidated in the United States since then. About six corporations own the majority of it. And he also said you need to be funding uh, ways to influence the court and the judicial process, since corporations will uh, obviously wind up in court when there's uh, civil suits or regulatory issues. And the final suggestion that Lewis Powell gave to the U.S. Chamber and businessmen at large, mostly men, was to uh, infiltrate the higher education system. He was deeply paranoid about student activism, about opposition to the Vietnam War, saw a lot of that as uh, communist sympathy or communist activism. And, and some of those fears are still 
uh, true among, among some of these old money families. I think Charles Koch is an example of somebody who was born into a culture that was paranoid about communism. He was a uh, elite, a man who inherited hundreds of millions of dollars from his father and eventually inherited his father's company. And that put him, I think, in a very different position than the average American of that day. So you use the term paranoid, and I think that's interesting. Um, mag megalomania run rampant, it seems, that you're describing. What, what motivates, what drives these people in, in, in the extreme ways that they've, they've taken their personalities, their, their drive to control, to dominate, to exploit? It seems like way over the top. Could you speculate to a certain extent about the Koch's uh, father? I mean, he, did, he also uh, worked with the Nazis, didn't he? He made some money with them. Um, and, also and that was something Soviet that Jane Mayer revealed that we didn't know before Dark Money came out, actually. Right. We, it was well known that um, Charles Koch's father, Fred Koch, had, had done some business with Joseph Stalin. Right. Um, and they, they made that kind of into part of their origin story. They were forthcoming about that connection, and they said that's what led to his paranoia about communism. They said he was watching his colleagues get murdered by the Russian state, or the Soviet Union at the time. And Charles Koch himself, um, I think, inherited some of that, but more important than that is he practiced it. Charles Koch was part of the radical, racist, anti-civil rights John Birch Society uh, at the height of the civil rights movement in this country. And he was working at the John Birch Society's bookstore in Wichita, Kansas. Um, he eventually split with the John Birch Society over opposition to the Vietnam War, not over opposition to their racist positions against civil rights and uh, you know, liberation of oppressed peoples in the US. So I think that's really important to note. But at the same time, Charles Koch very much sees himself as the good guy. I am pretty sure he has bought his story all the way. He, is, he thinks he's trying to make the country a better place. He thinks that he has the solutions and the resources and the know-how to do it. Um, and, and I certainly disagree with the way that I think he's going about things. I think the overall pattern is that public resources tend to get siphoned away from the people that need it and put in places where it's not needed, like the Charles Koch's bank account. So right. uh, I think a lot of his a lot of his rhetorical attacks against subsidies and and corporate welfare and corporate cronyism, I think he practices many of those things and he doesn't quite realize it. So or he may realize it and it height of hypocrisy or rationalization uh, in his personality. So the, the fact that he's so insistent, and I think that's a great point that, you, that you've made here, um, the true believer that this is someone that uh, sees themselves perhaps as a true savior uh, to go back, make us great again. We have a candidate today who says that over and over again. And what does that mean? What, is that, what are the code words that they're really operating there? And it is uh, at the basis of, of, the, of their uh, statements a, a degree of racism that's involved. So, but to bring back that old world where privilege, white privilege, uh, economic privilege, unquestioned authority uh, seems to be rooted in their personality. And of course, that's that was uh, a classic work that came out of the 60s, the authoritarian personality, uh, the totalitarian personality, the person that needs absolute control, the, their own self-hatred is projected onto others, and, and the need to control uh, and to dominate is, is actually rooted in their own sense of weakness and insecurity. Now, I, I want to go on and play armchair well, psychiatry here. Yeah, but go ahead, go ahead. Perhaps, perhaps it's weakness or insecurity, or perhaps they just don't see it that way at all. I mean, a lot of these, a lot of these folks, like I said, I think there is a reality disconnect. The way that Charles Koch was raised, the way that Charles Koch was born into a fortune, even mm. if he worked really hard, even if his dad was very cruel to him at times, or as he was, faced a as he strong was. disciplinarian, no. and I still think that creates a massive disconnect with the American population. I don't think Charles Koch is capable of putting himself in other people's shoes. And I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt here that he does have all the best intentions, but I think he is also a victim of what he would call uh, mental models, which is that, you know, it's kind of like confirmation bias, that we, that we see the things that validate what we have already thought. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, that he uh, should probably sit down and reconsider. Fair enough, fair enough, great point. Um, 
Tell us, run us through the ways in which, the obfuscuting ways in which these Koch brothers infiltrate the business world, the political world, the academic world. Uh, how do they actually get their money in there? It's hidden, right? It's covered up. It's not transparent. Um, how do they do it? Increasingly, you are correct. It is hidden. It's very hard uh, to track to trace. Uh, there are a few different ways that the money that it, that was once Coke Industries' profit uh, eventually becomes political influence. The, the way they traditionally have done this, or at least the way that that uh, reporters and activists like myself have understood it, is. Uh, through disclosed giving through their philanthropic foundations. Now, the David Koch does massive amounts of philanthropy in addition to his more uh, unpopular political activities, but David is much more prone to giving money to hospitals and things like that than Charles Koch is. Charles Koch spends a huge amount of his personal fortune on political groups um, and these universities, which it turns out are really an extension of his political activity. Uh, they have an integrated structure and they call it the structure of social change. So Charles Koch doesn't see giving the campuses as one thing and giving the think tanks as another thing and giving the politicians as a third thing. No, it's a whole pipeline. It's a, it's a production model that they intentionally mapped out. And the name that they have for this model is the structure of social change. The idea of the structure of social change, this was based off of economist Friedrich Hayek, um, a, a model of production that he had come up with. They borrowed Hayek's model and they said, if we want to influence culture change and we want to influence the adoption of policies that lead to culture change, the first thing we need to do is fund universities. We need professors, we need academics with high level elite wonky ideas that nobody else is going to spend the time to come up with on their own. We can fund those. From there though, we need to fund think tanks because they need to translate those wonky concepts into policy ideas, into something practical, something we can enact. And from there, the Cokes take the third step of funding uh, AstroTurf advocacy groups, groups like Americans for Prosperity, Concerned Veterans for America, Generation of Opportunity. They have all these different faux constituency groups that then apply the political pressure to enact the policies at the think tanks that they fund based on the ideas at the universities they fund. So that's what they're going with. And, and it's so far working out fairly well. And all of the organizations that they control in their network, as far as I can tell, use that model now, as I said, most of their funding was going through the private philanthropic foundations. That money is reported to the IRS and eventually to the public. What is not reported is uh, untraceable funds that go through what they call donor advised funds, a group like Donors Trust or Donors Capital Fund. It's based in Alexandria, Virginia. It's been running for a little over a decade now. And that group takes money from rich donors and anonymizes it and spits it out the other end to all of the same political interests and front groups that I'm talking about, but by the time it gets there, we have no idea who funded it. We don't know what projects it was earmarked for. That's what dark money is, uh, because those groups are influencing the policy conversation. They are pressuring politicians to do and not do certain things. And the public doesn't have the information to know who they're serving at that point. And I think that's a huge problem that Jane Mayer points out in her book. Why do you think they find such a welcome world in the academic world. Why do you think they see this as sort of a, an easy market for them to exploit in a sense? What, what is going on with that academic world in terms of their own values, in terms of their own research, their own careerist uh, goals? How does that fit in with the Koch brothers? Well, I think the main thing they want from the campus, if we keep that model of production in mind that I mentioned to you, the structure of social change, they're depending on academics to come out with the, the raw ideas that will eventually lead to a policy, will eventually lead to political action. They want a constant noise of anti-regulatory, anti-tax, um, pro-laissez-faire uh, market uh, in order for them to have the conditions upon which to, to fund political groups to, to operate with that in arena. The more that the American public accepts things like free markets, free enterprise, whether or not they know the definitions of those things or the selective definitions that somebody mm -hmm. like the Cokes might use, that helps them when there's an atmosphere of support for big business, for free markets, for industry, for unregulated, unfettered capitalism, essentially. Um, and those conditions are, uh, make it a lot easier for the Koch brothers to operate. So I think that's one of the main things 
uh, that they're looking to do is just create conditions that are more favorable. On the academic end, I right. think you might have some more insight than I would as a as a academic and as a professor. The need for funding in the modern universities is extreme, and uh, I, I should point out the irony that the Koch network is pushing uh, campaigns that defund state budgets. They're trying to cut corporate taxes. It's drying up revenue, and one of the consequences is that essential public services like affordable higher education have less money and then they need more private funds and people like Charles Koch are willing to put up that money so they're in addition to to creating conditions um, of a defunded university the Koch is is essentially acting as a predator as an opportunist and moving in with his private grants and he knows that the universities need money bad enough that most deans most administrators will turn a bit of a blind eye to the fact that he is trying to do things on campus that are unprecedented in terms of trying to steer the general direction the, of the professors, uh, the general things that the curriculum will favor and disfavor. Um, it's fairly predictable. And, and they figured out a very boring set of language and description words with which to mask that so that they don't get a whole lot of scrutiny. I'm, I'm hoping that because of work uh, by Uncoke My Campus and activists all over the country that that is slowly changing. Uh, but they've gotten away with this for a long time. And again, in Jane Mayer's book, Dark Money, she talks about Coke operatives for decades saying, hey, we need to use boring, vague language so that people don't know what we're up to. I thought that was one of the most interesting findings of the book. So again, that, that enables uh, the university world to rationalize taking the money because if they don't, the students are put in positions of having to pay a higher tuition. So sure. and the coaches right. have analyzed the university from an economic viewpoint. Um, we went to a conference in Las Vegas recently of, of co-funded professors, and they, they were saying how they see themselves in the university in terms of economics. They were talking about their comparative advantage uh, that they bring. They're, they're looking for their leverage points based on the economic strengths and weaknesses of the university. So folks should be aware that Koch looks at everything through an economic lens, and right. they know that they have a solid economic analysis on what they're in at a university is and, and what the no-nos are, and, and they have a very good idea then of, of what they might be able to exploit in terms of funding opportunities. And I think that's where you see things like the humanities and the social sciences. There's not as much private demand uh, for those courses and those departments to be funded. There's more private demand for something like Charles Koch's pet interests. And there's a question that needs to be asked. Is it okay for other uh, aspects of higher education to be displaced because that's not what a private donor is bidding for from the outside. Right. So in this neoliberal corporate university world, and let's bring it right down to a place like John Jay College of Criminal Justice where I teach, uh, there are so many ramifications, consequences to the ideas that professors may have in terms of possible policies. Um, my mentor was uh, Richard Cloward, who established the first war and poverty program uh, back in the early 60s, Mobilization for Youth. Entirely different culture. Um, there were, at, at, at uh, any given point, 50 different agencies worked with Mobilization for Youth. Hundreds, if not thousands of graduate students, lawyers, business people, academics, uh, social workers, and se et cetera, worked to deal with um, issues of poverty and delinquency and so on. Now, you're absolutely right. University world, the, I the world of ideas and critiques of ideas sometimes has, has an impact. Uh, in the 60s, it certainly there was a different cultural aura and there was a political uh, uh, statements that were being made in the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, and the university world became part of that struggle too. Now today, in this much more restricted economic period, a neoliberal corporate university uh, appeals to a different mindset among academics. And I, I hear what you're saying here is that academics, or some anyway, see themselves as Koch does, 
uh, the Koch brothers do, do as saviors of a system, of an institution. They are bringing money in, they're bringing in ideas that will lead to policies. And, and, and people really need to see the links between the money that's going into the neoliberal university and specifically the sort of criminal justice policies like stop and frisk, like mass incarceration. As you pointed out before, the privatization of prisons, the privatization of reentry programs. Now, run us through a little bit of, of how the Koch brothers' influence uh, uh, creates those sorts of links. Which sorts of links? Well, in the criminal justice world. Uh, their interest in so-called criminal justice reform, right, takes what form? What policies uh, does the Koch brothers' money eventually have in that field, and specifically? Does it, does it the find... Field of criminal, I mean, criminal justice is increasingly uh, kind of their central campaign, right. at least from a public relation, relations perspective. They know that uh, the majority of Ameri Americans are fed up with uh, the prison industrial complex. People understand that uh, there's way uh, way too high rates of, of incarceration in mm -hmm. this country. Way too many people in jail for low level offenses. Um, and Charles Koch himself is kind of appealing to uh, the popularity among youth by by pushing for legalization of marijuana, which is one of the main reasons so many people are in jail. Um, and for people that are in jail for low level drug offenses to get let out. Now, what Koch doesn't tell people as frequently is that uh, they are opportunists. They never invest in something, including a political campaign, if there's not a return on that investment. Charles Koch is an astute business person, and he wouldn't waste his cash with something that's not going to get him what he wants. Uh, so for a look at what their intentions with criminal justice reform uh, may actually be, we saw one bill in the U.S. House of Representatives touch on this issue and somebody had inserted a provision that would have made it harder to hold white collar criminals as the executive at ex Coke Industries have been known to be, um, make it harder to hold white collar criminals accountable based on making it harder to prove if they're intending to commit a crime or not. It's called mens rea and it's a, it's a provision of, of, uh, of the justice, of, of legal and justice system that uh, makes it so that you would need to have enough burden of proof that you could prove a white collar criminal is intending to commit a crime. Now for Coke Industries, we know this has been a problem with their history. Again, another thing from Jane Mayer's book is a constant uh, run-in with the law from Coke Industries on issues of pollution. They had a pipeline that exploded in Texas that was a disaster. It was aged infrastructure they weren't taking care of. They were, uh, you know, side sidestepping regulation and it resulted in, in the death of two, two teenagers. Uh, they covered up leaks of poisonous benzene from a refinery in Corpus Christi, Texas, and they were fined not only for the, the benzene leak itself, but also for covering up the benzene leak. And when the federal government was investigating for them for that case, they were hiring people to tail the, uh, the government, uh, the people that were investigating them. They were actually being spied upon, at least according to one or two of those investigators. Um, so we know that Coke is probably not doing exactly what they say they are when it comes to criminal justice. They know what it's like to get in trouble with the law, with their avidly anti-regulation, that's no secret. Um, so it seems like this would be a great excuse to take a much needed populist issue that this country mm. has to do. We have to reform the criminal justice system, in my opinion. Right. Um, but Charles Koch wants to insert something that will give him a little something on the side for all the money he's dumped into that political initiative. And, and what about uh, the monies or, or political conviction that they have toward privatization of prisons and of reentry? Uh, how does that play into their business model? That's a great question. In terms of Coke's direct investments in the private prison industry, I'm not aware of any. That doesn't mean they're not there. The company itself is, is private. It's not publicly traded. Um, I can't buy stocks, you can't buy stocks of Coke Industries, so there's some information that's limited, but we know that a lot of our coalition partners in the political world um, have been private for personal interests. For example, one of the most infamous uh, political front groups of the day is called the American Legislative Exchange Council, or, or ALEC is the acronym, and I think that's part of the reason it took off, is it's fun to talk about ALEC. ALEC sounds like a bad guy. Yeah. But, the American Legislative Exchange Council, what it does is it brings companies, including Coke Industries, 
uh, and formerly including a lot of private prison corporations, together with state legislators. So ALEC is funded to these corporations a different way to lobby, which is that they meet behind closed doors in private meetings with state representatives, and together they write copycat laws that then are disseminated in states all across the country. So this became uh, really big after Trayvon Martin was murdered in Florida. It was revealed there was a law in Florida that made it hard to prosecute his murderer. And it turned out that that law came from the NRA, the National Rifle Association, and it was passed in many other states after it passed in Florida because of the American Legislative Exchange Council, because of ALEC. Uh, and that's how they work. They take an idea, they, they wholesale it, they, they create template-based uh, bills that say insert state here, and then you see legislators all over the country pushing the same agenda, and you're wondering how they became so coordinated. Well, ALEC is one of the ways they became so coordinated. And ALEC is one of the places where Coke was working with the private prison industry. We saw that SB 1070, a uh, very unpopular bill a few years ago in Arizona, uh, was, was something that would have increased racial profiling. Uh, it, it was seen as an excuse for private prison companies to round brown people up, throw them in jail, and make money um, off of that service. And uh, Alec was involved in SB 1070. So Coke has been like at the conferences, in the room, when a lot of these shady prison deals have been going on. Um, and they've also been working in coalition with some of those groups with a project called Right on Crime, uh, which they funded through a front group in Texas. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of a lot of uh, political overlap between the Coke network and the private prison industry in terms of direct financial interests. I'm not sure if anybody's gone there and, and done the digging required to know. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, so, in terms of the business model. Um, You've highlighted some of the concerns, free enterprise, central to the business model, deregulation, central to the business model, and obviously profiteering. Is there anything else that one could talk about morally? Is this a moral issue besides making money, besides uh, deregulation? So, or, or another way of putting it, is there an alternative or countervailing moral uh, movement that can be developed uh, to counter this blatant, blatantly profitable uh, business model or business model based on profit I, and greed? I believe there is, Jim, and I think actually what... What I've come to realize over doing this work, it, it hit me a few months ago, is there were two, there were three concepts that seemed to be very tough for uh, the Coke network to swallow. One is diversity. I think inherently a lot of the work, especially what you're seeing on campus, um, is, is, a, is a tacit pushback against diversity and against the changing demographic of the country and against inclusivity. And I don't think they actually necessarily mean that. I don't think their, their sophistication of race relations is really there even to, to, to know that they're missing the point. But I think diversity is a major threat. And that's why you see uh, our work on campus, the concerns that we're, we have with the Koch-funded uh, departments uh, uh, narrowing their focus to favor certain fields that the code prefer, code prefers. Their their backlash, their retort to us has been that we're against the diversity of thought. Well, I have a feeling if you look at what the diversity of thought means to them, you're going to see a lot of white guys winding up the university. Is just my feeling. The second thing I think that they have a lot of trouble wrapping their heads around is is sustainability. The Coke Industries is pretty far away from sustainability as a group that's involved in deforestation and chemical products and oil refining and tar sands leasing in Canada. Uh, uh, sustainability is a major threat. Sustainability is also a major trend on the American campus exactly. um, and among the United States public too. People like sustainability as a concept. People don't like it when it's inaccessible. People don't like it when it's expensive, uh, but people do like uh, being cautious with resources, being thrifty. It's, I think it's part of our value system in the USA. Um, so diversity, sustainability, and the third, I think, is transparency. With dark money, uh, is about as anti-transparent as you can get when it comes to political funding. Uh, we see the Kochs hide their communications with professors. We've watched them try to keep their contracts with the university secret. All of the communication that happens between Coke World and the think tanks and all that, that tends to happen 
on the side in a, in a place the average person could not access. It's an exclusive activity. So I think transparency is another condition that the Koch network relies upon. And the more that we see a transparent and open, a sustainable and a diverse uh, country emerging, the more uh, threats there are kind of to the Koch mindset, the Koch way of doing things. And I think you'll see all of their campaigns fit into some, some backlash against one of those three themes. And that is much of your research, is to, in a sense, point that out, isn't it? Um, you, do you do a lot of work on campus? Do you, do you organize students or do you make uh, trips to campuses and, and talk about it with, with students? Well, as you talk of, with me? Uh, not as much as you think, at the risk of sounding lazy. Hmm. Um, We've taken a different a different model of, of organizing. It, uh, I think a lot if, if people out there that are community organizers and you know get the jargon and the buzzwords that right. happen in that community, there's a certain a certain template and way of doing things that's that's fairly established. But I think as as the progressive community comes to grip with its own privilege, we realize that a lot of times that comes out in in the form of top down uh, presumptive organizing of communities who don't need somebody to come in and organize them. They just need access to resources, or they just need something else in order to let them speak for themselves. So when we formed Uncoat My Campus, um, we took a hard line against giving directives to students. We're more responding to their energy, responding to their tactical ideas, and telling them what strategic framework that we are operating yeah. in. We being Greenpeace. Um, and then some of the supporting organizations uh, that have helped guide the UNCOKE students. But all the organizing that you see campus to campus, um, and indeed a lot of the national activity, the days of action that we do, those are, those are designed by the students on different campuses. And the, way, the reason we do that is actually also strategic. It's, it's just that authentic activity um, goes a lot further dollar for dollar than inauthentic activity. And I think that's why you have to see the Coke Network spending hundreds of millions of dollars to feign authenticity. So campus groups contact you, or how does that work? How do you uh, work with the energy that is occurring among some campus groups? How do sure. they know about your organization? Usually your they contact us. Like I, I told you a bit about our origin story. For me, it was seeing uh, Florida State activity in 2011. In 2012, that's when George Mason students came to Greenpeace and said, hey, our economics professor is funded by Coke, and he says climate change doesn't exist. And then after that, we saw Suffolk University in Boston and Kansas University. That was, that was the formation. Since then, many other campuses have been involved. Most of them have reached out to us. We've, we've done what we can on our scrappy website, uncoatmycampus.org, to make our contact information fully available. Um, we just want to have the research out there so that people understand there are, there are people like us that they can contact if they have questions about, about resources, about research itself, about uh, strategic options. Uh, but it's usually up to them to contact us. There are times where a scandal blows up uh, at a campus in some part of the country and we you know, race to Facebook or, or whatever we have to see if we know anybody in the right state or the right region, but that's not something we're capable of forcing. So for the most part, we're either getting lucky and somebody answers when we reach out or people are coming to us and that's how we found um, some of our most proactive campuses um, that have recently joined. Uh, there are students at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, who really just answered the call after a, after a, a scandal blew up on campus and they were asking us for help and support, we ended up sending uh, an organizer named Ralph Wilson to share some of his research with them. So it's been really, it's been really fascinating to watch um, the process, which with these schools in different regions of the country and very different uh, cultures and microcultures are are feeling the same trend, and and they're finding us, and that's that's giving us a lot of affirmation that we really are onto something. I bet. How about various environmental groups? How about Black Lives Matter? Have they been connecting to you? Black Lives Matter has not, although, I mean, it, Black Lives Matter is one of those things where there's a more formal part of the organization, and then there's the, the less formal part, which might be much more sprawling, but volunteers all over the country who are putting their time and energy into pushing a, a Black Lives Matter uh, into practical policy action, regulatory action, and, and also standing up against injustice. I think. They probably, I don't know that I either see it 
to as many immediate connections between Uncoke My Campus and the immediate priorities of Black Lives Matter, like police militarization, uh, like criminalization. So I suspect that we haven't heard from them because I don't think we have much to offer them in terms of immediate solutions to their immediate needs. Uh, that's at the environmental community uh, uh, and the good governance community, especially. Um, a lot of the people that are responding in the in the in the political world uh, off campus to us are folks who are bumping into issues of dark money. So a lot of the groups like Common Cause, uh, I mentioned the American Federation of Teachers. Um, those are some of the groups who have been supportive uh, with with our with our asks for help because they are too are bumping up against the same mechanism um, that has become obstructing political progress. It's money in politics. It's money as free speech, and uh, and it's how the average voice is drowned out when when money is given so much political influence. Well, a, a total natural would be the Sanders campaign, right? I mean, have, have you been working with them or did work with them? Have they reached out? Uh, for, well, long before uh, Sanders was a presidential candidate, I did talk with one of his staff, who I don't think is there anymore, about the campaign. But you know, Greenpeace isn't an organization that endorses candidates. We can't interchange money with any candidates. Right. We're not innocent. We don't align with either the Republican nor the Democratic Party. In fact, usually they both, uh, both of the parties hate us because we're hypercritical of, of both of them. They're both in bed with the natural gas industry um, and, and oftentimes aren't doing enough on climate change as, as much as Greenpeace would like. Um, so we try to stay out of that because it just it makes, it makes our independence impossible when you start aligning with a political candidate. Um, and so what more, we're, we set ourselves as out front. If we're doing good enough work, we will see politicians respond to us. And I'm very excited to say that we did just see uh, Senator Chuck Schumer in New York, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren in Massachusetts, and Senator Sheldon Whitehouse in Rhode Island. They just put up a, a blog on Huffington Post a couple of weeks ago that cited um, some of Jane Mayer's research. And it was uh, in relation to a political appointee uh, uh, to the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, who would be anti-Social Security and uh, uh, towing the Koch agenda in many ways, and he himself is an alumnus of the whole Koch network. He came from the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. So, but like, like we're hoping to, politicians should follow the lead when we're really onto something, when we're really uh, connecting the dots in a way that reporters maybe haven't had time to do or uh, political staff aren't half the time to do. I know that, that John Jay hasn't been a particularly politically active campus, although, as you know, we had a, uh, a very well-received panel uh, at the Left Forum uh, this past May on dark money. Um, and my colleague, Dolores Jones-Brown, who was in communication with President Travis of John Jay, uh, confronting him about the possibility of Coke money on campus uh, was uh, part of that effort. Um, and uh, the, the result of those emails, by the way, between the two of them, uh, resulted in more or less a belief that people should just uh, abide by academic freedom and uh, whoever is, is getting that money or not is not the uh, issue of anybody else on campus, which of course Dolores uh, disagreed with vehemently. Uh, the other point that I think was important is um, that there is this, again, as we pointed out, as you pointed out before, the, the, fi the financial crisis on campus makes it so easy for university presidents to rationalize the use of this money um, and, and there is no moral uh, center to their to their vision other than just balancing a budget or trying to. So I wonder, um, because I think John Jay would be a crucial place to organize, to, to, um, to direct some of the energy that you're talking about to the faculty. Um, I know that the faculty um, has been very uh, demoralized by a lot of the financial uh, situations uh, that, that were going on, at, at, at not only at John Jay, but across City University. Um, so again, what, do you, what would you think 
need, needs to be done to get the faculty members uh, more motivated? Or is that a possibility uh, that can happen so that these faculty members begin to see their moral, um, moral necessity to confront the system in a way that you have? Sure. Well, I, I first I'll recognize that this is very easy for me to say. My job is not on the line here. I know a lot of professors are afraid to speak out uh, because they don't feel they have great job security. If you're tenured, uh, great, congratulations. But a lot of people are having trouble getting tenure now. We're seeing political attacks on tenure in Wisconsin and other places. Um, and we're seeing increasingly that, you know, tenure being put aside and adjunct faculty are hired. So right. people are getting part-time salaries or or just getting lower reduced wages by being put in the ad adjunct pool. Um, but what I can say is that Uncoke My Campus and the, and the work that we've done and the research that we've done would be nothing without the guidance of some of these professors. And whether it was public or private, whether we were following a report that was published or whether we called somebody up and just said, hey, can you make sure we have this right? We wouldn't be able to do this work without that. And if there are more professors speaking up, um, even if even if they're not coming out and saying certain things, even if they can't advocate for a position or take a stand on an issue, sometimes their expertise or sometimes their perspective, even if it's put as an explicit, here's my own opinion, sometimes that's really helpful because a lot of that context isn't out there. What, what folks need to realize, professors get steamrolled when it comes to public relations. If you're Absolutely. not talking, somebody else is talking for you. If you're and not filling the space... Somebody else is filling the space for you. Coke and is paying people to fill the space constantly. So we need the other opinion out there, even if you don't think it's going to be as sexy or get as much attention or it won't matter. It, it does actually matter. You get to speak up for oneself and to validate oneself as an expert if you're living in those conditions. Absolutely. Uh, somebody like me would use that. Absolutely. And listen, we're, we're fast running out of time. I want, Connor, I have such great admiration and respect for what you're doing. Uh, we're going to try and carry that tradition, that energy that you're giving uh, onto campus as well. I thank you so much, Connor, and I thank you so much, all of you, for listening to The Radical Imagination. College presidents, boards of trustees, administrators and academics usually don't speculate on the moral and concrete influence of big individual and corporate money on their academic environment, the work they produce and policies that flow from their work. The fact that they don't is nothing new. As Noam Chomsky in his 1969 book, American Power and the New Mandarins pointed out, many American intellectuals and academics in the face of American military and police power performed as appeasers, pacifiers, and apologists for the system. Using the veil of scientific objectivity, of value-free social science, academic freedom, and their privileged roles to avoid taking moral stands. Chomsky made it very clear and simple. We should apply to ourselves the same standard that we apply to others. He called it the principle of ethical universality. Chomsky would ask if police commissioners Bill Bratton and Ray Kelly are willing to apply stop and frisk policies to their own children. Would college presidents who join justice departments and signings of major crime bills they now decry as terrible mistakes be willing to think outside the box and end the idea and practice of punishment? within the system, as they've also said. Which versions of these politicians and college presidents are we getting today? Dark money in the academy helps fuel the ignorance and bigotry of the system, and those of us in that world who deny it are complicit in a rigged and deeply immoral system of mendacity and groupthink. The moral vacuity and emptiness of the present neoliberal university should be crystal clear. It's open to the highest bidder of dark money. The Koch brothers and others are only too happy to fill the moral vacuum. Thank you, Connor, for helping to expose the need for a true moral movement on campus, and thank you all for watching The Radical Imagination. See you again next week.